tell me please, is there a place in this world where there is not a cry for better rulership? It is not something new, is it? It was true in the days of Jesus Christ as it is today. And that is why Jesus told his followers back then and by extension, you and I today, to pray for God's kingdom to come. You know it well. It's the Our Father prayer. But Jesus went further. In his promise to the faithful anointed followers of his, he told them that they will rule with him as king. Now, if you have a good friend who always fulfill their promise, make a promise to you, you trust that promise, don't you? Well, anointed followers of Christ trust his promise. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28 and recall that promise that Jesus made to them. Beginning in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 19, Guess what it says. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the recreation, when the Son of Man sits down on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You know, Jesus said in the recreation, these anointed ones will sit down on throne and do judging. Well, the 12 tribes of Israel here, that is the world of mankind outside of the heavenly ruling class. However, what Jesus said at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 47 will help us to see the extent of the rule, that it, just not, it does not just include the earth. You may recall his words there in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 47. He said, he will appoint them over all his belongings. So what do all the belongings include? Well, Jesus did not qualify the word all as, as to limit his belongings to earthly things. But what we appreciate about Jesus is what he later said in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. He said that all authority had been given him in heaven and on earth. So, Jesus made this promise to a small group of anointed followers, also that they will receive a fine reward for their faithfulness. You may recall Revelation chapter 5 verse 10. He said, and you made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God and they will rule as kings over the earth. Did you notice in the scriptures we read thus far, or quoted, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, they will rule as judges. And then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, it mentions there that there will be kings and priests. It is good to note that because, you see, as kings... They will share in directing the affairs of this earth. What that is going to mean is the end of the troubles as we know it on the earth today due to bad rulership. Yes, crooked politicians, corrupt governments, gone, ended, no more. When they act as priests, they will serve to educate and heal mankind. Bring them to the state of perfection. Have you visited a hospital lately? It's a sad state to see the effect of a disease and what it's having on mankind. Hospitals, funeral homes, gone in the new system under this arrangement. And as judges, they will participate in administering God's law. Now, these are not just ordinary judges. These are judges that are powerful. The scriptures in uh, Romans chapter 16 verse 20, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 3, help us to see the power these judges have. 
because it mentions there that these judges will judge wicked angels and they are going to share in getting rid of the most corrupting influence in this universe, Satan the devil and his demons. What a difference this will bring for the world of mankind. But because you and I have been under the rulership of mankind for so long and have seen the disappointment that it brings, and in case the question lingers in your mind as to whether or not the 144,000 will be good rulers, remember this. Before their resurrection to heavenly life, they lived as humans here on this earth. Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, the sea portion of that scripture says this about them. These were brought from among, kind, from among mankind as first fruits to God and the Lamb. Now we're going to share with you this morning eight reasons as to why we are confident, and you can have the same confidence, that the 144,000 will indeed be good rulers. Number one. They were from all nations and of both genders, male and female, on earth. They live and love the truth, and they live blameless lives. In the 14th chapter of Revelation, verse 5, it says this about them. And no deceit was found in their mouth. They were without blemish. Reason number two. They prove their loyalty to Jehovah God and to his son, Jesus Christ. Reason number three, they hated what was bad. And after their anointing, the scripture in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, a portion says, they no longer contaminated themselves with false religion. In fact, it says this, these are the ones who did not defile themselves with women, the woman spoken of here is none other than that corrupting influence of Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlot and of the disgusting things of the earth. Instead, the 14th chapter of Revelation verse 4b says, they kept following the lamb no matter where he goes. And so we can appreciate that they have broken free from the contamination of Babylon the Great. And it is for this reason then, that before the outbreak of the Great Tribulation, each will receive a final sealing, attaining them uh, just before they attain their heavenly reward. Reason number four, they experience problems like those that would be faced by the Armageddon survivors, as well as those that will be coming back in the resurrection. They also went through all the manner of illnesses, and they experienced the ravage of old age. And you know what this imperfect body have taken us through. Well, they experienced that as well, reason number five. They knew the pain of losing loved ones in death, reason number six. Reason number seven, they overcame temptation and heartaches, and they too were victims of racial, social, and religious injustices. And finally, reason number eight, they experience problems unique to Jehovah's servants, opposed by the devil and this world. In fact, here's how they're spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. If you'd like to follow along, we're going to read verse 4 of Revelation chapter 20. And here's what it says. And I saw thrones, and those who sat down on them were given authority to judge. Yes, I saw the souls of those executed for the witness they gave about Jesus and for speaking about God. And those who had not worshipped the wild beast or its image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. You notice again that the scriptures describe them as sitting on throne, as judges, and the reason uh, to help us see from where they came and why they were rewarded was because they witnessed about Christ and they were loyal to Jesus Christ. 
They did not perceive the mark of the image, again helping us to appreciate they no longer contaminated themselves with the corrupt system of this old world. How well that scripture describes the background of the 144,000. As such, these ones will be much better as empathetic and patient as imperfect humans, in judging imperfect humans, as perhaps the angels of the heavens would be. Now, perhaps you may have known some of these faithful anointed ones while on earth, and this morning, we're going to speak with brother and sister J.R. Brown of the Brooklyn Bethel, and they too have known some of these anointed ones before they receive their heavenly reward. So let's start with Brother Brown. Brother Brown, please tell us, what fine example of faithful anointed one set for you? Hello? Hello? Remember me? Same ones. We're back here again. But uh, <laughs> as I alluded to earlier, in the congregation where I grew up, we had six or seven anointed at all times. And of course, we got to know them, but you took them for granted. But when I really became closely attached to some was when I asked the organization if I could have an assignment to go where the need is greater. And I thought they would just tell me to wait a year or two more and then send me somewhere. But I, it came through the mail. They assigned me to go down to Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And uh, that's just 45 miles south of Norfolk, Virginia. And so when we went there, the overseer of the congregation was a brother, John R. Cole, C-O-L-E. He and his wife had been working that as a pioneer territory. And Brother Cole and Sister Cole were both of the anointed. And they had been driving from Norfolk, Virginia, down to Elizabeth City, North Carolina, for a number of years. And here they had a nice congregation of about 40 publishers going. And so the organization said, well, this would be a good assignment for you to go and work in. Well, what a privilege it was to work among these brothers and sisters and with Brother Cole. Now, Brother Cole was still driving down from Norfolk, Virginia every week, almost one time, but by then he was 83 years old and getting kind of tired of making that trip. So they thought, well, we'll send some young people down to help him out in this territory. And what a blessing it proved to be especially to work with him. Well, I would ride with him in his car. Nobody else would because everybody was scared to ride with Brother Cole because he was zealous not only for preaching but zealous for driving this old car. And it made everybody nervous, but then he went out and found these people because we had five counties to work in. We had uh, Pascatane County, Currituck County, Hertford County, and we worked uh, all of those in and around that area, all the way down to Manio, Kill Devil Hills, Kitty Hawk, and all of those places along the ocean. And what a wonderful time to watch Brother Cole, who did not waver in any way in his zeal. He had a determination to reach these people. And I could see right in front of me, well, look how Jehovah has blessed him. You have a little congregation, and you have all these people in the truth, and some of them were servants by then, ministerial servants, and they wanted to follow his example in preaching. And of course, it was a privilege for me to be able to work along with him and preach in that territory where he had uh, not only laid the foundation, but had gone back year after year studying with them. But it was obvious he was getting near the end of the line with his health uh, assets diminishing but he still had that zeal to want to tell the truth to others. And you could see it right before your eyes. Here are all of these brothers and sisters, I guess about 40 or 45 at that time, and they were ready to keep preaching this good news of the kingdom. So what a privilege it was to be associated with him as an anointed one. Of course, and his wife, she came down too, but... Uh, she didn't want to ride with him either. She took the, <laughs> she took the bus down from uh, Norfolk to Elizabeth City every week. She said so she could ride safely. <laughs> but, uh, it was certainly a wonderful privilege to work with them in this territory and see how Jehovah had blessed them 
to get the fruitage and help people learn the truth and build themselves into a congregation there. Thank you very much for that first time experience, Brother Brown. We're going to ask Sister Brown the same question. Well, uh, actually, this started when I came to Bethel in 1980, and for the next 10 years, I worked with two faithful sisters of the anointed um, in the sewing room, Sister Grace DeCheca and Sister Catherine Bogart. And of course, <clears throat> this was a privilege because working in the sewing room, they could talk all day long, and they talked about the history of the organization, the things that they had experienced. Uh, Sister DeCheca had come to Bethel in 1916. She had been married to her husband by Brother Russell. So they had a fine history going all the way back there. During the 1918 time of imprisonment, Sister DeCheca told her about how she would go down to Atlanta and take the brothers fruits and things of that nature because they, the food was not that good. So she would make those trips to Atlanta uh, where they were imprisoned during 1918. So this was very, very interesting to hear this firsthand history. Sister Bogart and her husband, Sister Bogart, came to Bethel in 1920. And she had served in Bethel all along. Both these sisters were in their 80s at the time that I got to know them. Uh, she and her husband had the privilege of working at Kingdom Farm up in South Lansing, New York during the war years of World War II. And she told the experience of how that the enemies of the truth had decided that Jehovah's Witnesses had a Nazi airstrip up there and that they were going to let the Nazis come into the country. This is because of the anti-Jehovah's uh, Witness attitude of that time. And so uh, they were determined to burn what, uh, what Kingdom Farm down and how that they had to stay up all night and a friendly uh, state trooper made the people just keep on moving because, because the mob came to actually burn down Kingdom Farm as a result of these false rumors that had started. So they had all of these tremendous experiences and it was just a privilege to sit there and listen to them tell what happened in the early days. Both of them had worked with the photodrama of creation before coming to Bethel. So they had all the experiences of being there in Pennsylvania, going from city to city, showing the photodrama. So it was a tremendous privilege to work with these two sisters. And we thank you both. You have a great So brothers, to bring this symposium to a close, we're going to uh, go through the review question. The first one, why is God's rulership superior to man's? The answer, 1 John 4, 8, because divine rulership is perfect and rooted in Jehovah's qualities. It will satisfy mankind's every.